pass in this orthodoxy in the 21st century, which we have subtitled, if you might remember, uh, Always Relevant and Always the Same. So um, we move on from uh, our last class, which, if you may remember, was Who is Jesus? We begin always with Christ. Uh, we are a Christocentric faith. Um, and that's especially evident liturgically. For example, when we celebrate the divine liturgy, the entire liturgy <laughs> itself is the prayer of Christ that he offers to the Father. And we assemble in order to commune or make ourselves one with that prayer of Christ. And we do so how? Through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Or as St. Paul says so beautifully and simply in his letters, uh, we are in Christ being reconciled to the Father through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But only because Christ is the one, the Messiah of God, the Father's anointed one, who has taken the initiative, initiative himself to come to where we are, each of us in our lives, in order to accomplish our salvation. Tonight again, we're going to speak about this question. I love to ask rhetorical questions because so does Jesus. The Gospels are filled with these kinds of questions where most everybody knows what the answer is. And so the question tonight is, does the Bible make sense? How would we answer that question? <clears throat> yes, we believe that it makes sense. But not everybody does. Not everybody does. And so I feel that as we move through this series, we should take a look at the way that we as Orthodox Christians read and interpret the Holy Scriptures. What role does the Bible play in our life as Orthodox Christians? So let's go ahead to the first slide. And we are going to just ask this question, what is the Bible? What is the Bible? I love getting back to these basics. So the Bible, as you can see here, is not a single through written, through written book. What do we mean by that? Well, if I pick up a novel, let's say a novel by one of my favorite, um, a fictional novel written by one of my favorite authors, let's say uh, Dostoevsky, Crime and Punishment. It's through written in the sense that it has a beginning, a middle, and what? An end. The Bible is not so neatly written or composed or even organized in this sense. What we're going to say is that it's a book of holy books. It's the holy scriptures. And the, the, the word that is used or the phrase that is used in the original Greek, Greek is taviblia, which is the sacred writ, the holy <clears throat> scriptures. And in the Orthodox Church, um, and we're not going to have as much time as I would like to get into it, but um, we would say all in all that in this book, binding of the Holy Bible, there are 76 books. Go ahead. And if we take a look at that, now you all have a paper in front of you that shows you what these books are. The books of the Bible were written, who wrote the Bible? Another good question, basic question. What is the Bible? It's a collection of writings, holy writings, right? Uh, that, that has been passed down to us and formed into a single volume. That would be a better way to say it. And it was written by various people, mostly Jews. I can think of at least one Bible book in the Old Testament that is not Jewish at all. And maybe I'll give that, uh, I'll, I'll put that question to you and give anybody who knows what the answer is a gold star. Um, but they were written over the course of 3,000 years. Um, and um, as we see up here as well, the Old Testament was written in what language? It was written in Hebrew, which was one of the common Semitic languages, one of the Semitic languages uh, in the Middle East at that time. And the New Testament was written in Greek, in a form of classical Greek, 
or even what we might call late classical Greek that was spoken uh, during the time of Jesus and during the time of the apostles in, in the first century. As a matter of fact, if we had more time to take a look at the Old Testament, we would even see that the books in the Old Testament, some of them were written much later, and at least one of them for sure was originally written in, in Greek as well, um, and that is, of course, the book of Daniel. The prophecy of Daniel, we, as we have it now, uh, it is coming from the, the Greek language. Um, and this is also something that is very important, that the Holy Spirit is the author of the Bible. The Bible was written by the Holy Spirit. And this is why it still remains today as what kind of a book? A book that is the most widely read of all within, um, within even modern history. There's no other book that has been as widely read or has been as much published over the centuries as, as has been the Bible. And of course, we in the Orthodox Church believe that what makes the Bible unique is that it is, um, is, it is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Or to use the language of the Holy Fathers, what they say about the Scriptures is that they are God-breathed. That's what they mean when they say in English that the Bible is inspired by the Holy Spirit, that these, these writings have the breath of the Holy Spirit running, uh, running through them. Um, now this is probably the most important uh, place to start with the Bible. Um, we're going to say, how do we read the Bible? Well, we read the Bible basically in two ways. We read it in church together during the liturgy, which is huge for us as Orthodox Christians, and we'll be talking more about that. And we also read it on a personal basis, hopefully at home as part of our a prayer discipline or a rule of prayer. And, and we do it on a daily basis. But at the very heart of the Bible, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, is the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is why we began last week with Christ himself again. The Old Testament scriptures all speak about the coming of God's anointed one, the Messiah, and then the very substance of the New Testament writings and books and letters and, and the Apocalypse, the very substance of all those writings is our Lord Jesus Christ himself. So we might take a look at um, this very well-known um, occurrence in... Um, in uh, um, uh, the Gospel of St. Luke, where after the resurrection, Luke and Cleopas are walking on the famous road to Emmaus. And they meet this stranger. And who is this stranger that they don't recognize? Who is it? Jesus. It's Jesus. But Jesus risen from the dead in his glorified <coughs> body. So they don't recognize him because he's been glorified in his new body. And they don't even recognize his voice. And then they start to have a discussion. And at the end of this discussion, this stranger, our Lord, has to explain to these apostles, both Luke and Cleopas, what was going to happen to the Christ, that he would be betrayed, condemned, crucified, and that he would rise on the third day. And then he says to them this, or Luke says uh, uh, about this passage. Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, which is the Old Testament, he, Jesus, the one who's now talking to them, explained to them, Luke and Cleopas, and here's the kicker, all the things in the scriptures concerning what? What does it say? Himself. All the things in the scriptures are pertaining to him. This is the lens through which we read the entire, the whole Bible. Right? Good. So, now we have what we call a canon of Scripture. The word canon, it just means a rule or a standard. So, in the uh, common, everyday work, let's say, of a construction worker, a builder, 
he would have a straight line that is called what? What is it called? Yeah, a plumb line. Now they have, they replaced the old plumb lines with lasers, right? You just put the laser to the wall and you, 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 mark, you mark the spot, right? But they had a plumb line that would hang down and it would hang straight so that you knew what that line was, that the line was straight. That's the word canon. Here are the, 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 the proper, here are the straight books, the ones that we recognize. 53 Old Testament books, 27 New Testament books. And it is the Orthodox Church. Well, at that time, it was also the Catholic Church. We are still calling ourselves Catholic. We don't call ourselves Roman Catholic. Um, we are Orthodox Catholic. And it was the church from the very beginning which decided that these books would be collected into a single volume that we now call the Scriptures or the Bible. And we're going to speak more about that. Does everybody see the sheet that I gave you? So in the sheet that I gave you, this is the full or the expanded list of all of the Orthodox writings. And it's expanded because there are more books in the canon, in the volume, than you would find in uh, the Protestant churches. <coughs> they cut some of them out. There's a reason that they did that, but I don't have time to get into that tonight. Um, perhaps we can talk about it later. But as you can see, the Bible is divided in two by Christ himself with the writings that came before him, which we call the Old Testament, and the writings that come after that come after him, which we call what? The New Testament. Who put all of this together? The church did. The Holy Fathers. And especially um, the, uh, the early bishops, the bishops of the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd centuries, which we're going to talk about uh, a little bit more. Because it can be kind of, it can be kind of, um, it can be kind of exciting. So, Criteria for how these books are collected into the volume of the Bible. Um, what and who decided um, that these are legitimate apostolic books? Because you may not know it. And um, I, I took some time, a couple of years, to study it myself when I was in my late 20s. And it's a fascinating history, those first uh, two or three hundred years in the early church. There were hundreds of books that were floating around. Uh, people who, uh, who lived in the Mediterranean world, especially in Egypt and in Greece and in Rome. There were hundreds of these books. Not all of them were what we called canonical, the books that we have today. So the church would call counsel with all of the bishops and say, well, which, which are the right which are the right books? Because we have to make sure that our people are not reading these false writings that are, are not are not um, that are not apostolic. That was the basic question. Are these books that we have that are being passed around, you know, uh, by our people? If they were done in scrolls, are they apostolic in origin or not? Well, we can expand that to three guidelines. Uh, or three criteria. The first is, and this is especially for the New Testament, who wrote it? Authorship. The books came into the New Testament canon only if there was an author that was attached to that writing. So who are the four Gospels that we have? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, there was one book in the New Testament that passed into the canon by the skin of its teeth for one reason, because we don't know who wrote it. Who wants to guess what book that is? We know that John booked the, wrote the book of Revelation. Yeah. Hebrews. Who said Hebrews? Rick? Mike? No. Mike? <laughs> <laughs> no. So it's a letter to the Hebrews. It's attributed to Paul and it's very Pauline in its content, but we do not know for sure who wrote the letter to the Hebrews, but it's in the canon. Um, so we gave it a pass. 
It's a wonderful book. The second uh, criterion was content. What is in this book? If this book did not speak of Christ and his cross, it was rejected. And there were many of those Gospels floating around uh, that were fake. They, they were fake Gospels. The Gospel of St. Thomas, the Gospel of St. Mary Magdalene. These were not apostolic in origin. And even they were purported to have been written by one of the Apostles. The content of those books was not the content of Christ incarnate and his cross. There's another book that does not have the cross in it in the New Testament. Which one? Stay up. You just mentioned it. Revelation. Revelation does not mention the book, does not mention the cross, but you have the crucified, well, you have the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. And the fathers and the bishops of the church said, ha ha, close enough. That's the cross. You see what I'm saying? Um, close enough. And then the, the final one, which is fascinating, is that all of these legitimate bona fide books had to have been in use all over the churches during the worship services. Right? So basically, the bishops and the Holy Father said, Okay, which books have we been reading in our church? And which books have been read uh, from the time that everything began? And, and which of these books is, is um, you know, um, uh, which, of, which are the books that are kind of universal, right? They're read in Greece, they're read in Egypt, they're read in the Middle East, um, they're read in Gaul, they're read in Britain. You know, there was, there was an early Orthodox Christian church in Britain up until the, the late the late third century, late fourth century. Um, these same books, 27 books of the New Testament, were read everywhere. And so the, the fathers of the church have to come together and say, we're not going to, we're going to accept these books by saying, these are the other books that we don't accept. These are the ones that have been in use from, from, uh, from the very beginning. Does that make sense to you? Any questions about that? Any questions? Yes, Liz. Over 300 years. Over 300 years. Matter of fact, Hebrews, like I said, was the last to come into the canon, the New Testament canon, in the Eastern churches. And the book of Apocalypse, John's Apocalypse, Revelation, was the last to come into the Western churches. Why did the book of Revelation get a pass? Its content was, was Christian. Its content was about the Lord Jesus Christ. It contained the teaching of the cross. But which is the only book in our church that we do not read during uh, the, 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 the year of our lectionary? The book of Revelation. Why is that? Because the lectionary came together very early. Very, very early. And so the lectionary is already set. And then they decide that the, the, the book of Apocalypse gets to be put in, into this volume. Isn't that cool? There's some really neat things. Now, the book of Revelation is fun stuff. It's an exciting stuff. But if you don't know the Old Testament really well, and especially the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, especially the book of Daniel, you're not going to get anywhere with the book of Revelation. Because all of the images that come, the, the message that comes out of the book of Revelation, it is all from, from the Old Testament. So, so that's it. Okay, Rick. Thank you, Father. Good evening, everyone. That's a great question, by the way. Uh, it's a great question because um, not only did it take close to 400 years, it was late 300s when the canon was finally uh, put together. The canon changed over... Uh, the course of those 300 years several times. Two books in particular almost didn't make it. In the year 200, if you look at the canon in the year 200, it looks very different than the 27 books that we have in the New Testament now. Some years the book of James was in, some years Revelation was in, some years Revelation was out. Revelation was out 
pretty much right up until the end, and then it got in. So it's interesting to see how that canon changed and how some books made it and how some books didn't make it. But, um, so it's a great question because it's going to touch on something about the authority of how the Christians got around and how they learned when they didn't have a Bible. We'll touch on that in a, in a moment. Okay, um, let me start this way. I was very, very, very happy as a Protestant for 20 years. I, it was great. I was off to Bible college. Life was good. I was studying to be a youth pastor. And, um, you know, I loved to be able to claim a Cadillac when I wanted it. And, um, you know, laser shows were cool. I mean, I was very happy. I could... <laughs> yeah, I ended up quitting because of that. Um, I made a mistake one day in Bible college, and I went up to my New Testament professor because it popped into my head. I don't know why. I'm not that smart. It just came into my head. Uh, thank God. But the question came in because as a diehard evangelical, we base everything. I mean everything on Scripture. And it's literal. We believe it's 100% literal, and everything comes from Scripture. And I asked this professor, who wrote the Bible? And I got the typical, well, God breathed through the Holy Spirit. Yeah, I got all that. It's not what I asked. How did we get it? Anybody in this room ever remember Jesus saying there would be a New Testament? In fact, when Jesus mentioned the word Scripture, what was he referring to? The Old Testament. Why? Why was he only referring to the Old Testament? Because that's all there was. We didn't get a New Testament for another 400 years after he's gone. How did the early church survive without a Bible? And whose authority did they lean on for those 400 years? I got one better for you. When was the printing press done? About 1600. For most of humanity, do we have the majority of humanity literate or illiterate? Illiterate. How hard was it in the, er, let's say, before the years 300 to 1600 to get a copy of a book of any kind? If you wanted to read Harry Potter in the year 1000, where are you going to go? Nowhere. They're very expensive. Nobody can read, right? And you're lucky. Some churches had maybe a parchment of a book, one book of the Bible. Other churches had different ones. So how did the church survive for 1,600 years, 2,000 years? Really, the, 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 everybody in the world now having access to a Bible, that's only about 200 years old. So vast majority of history, most of the Christian church did not have access to a complete scripture. So how did they survive? Whose authority? The reason I asked that is this. I asked the question of the New Testament professor, who put the Bible together? And the answer I got changed my life. I'm in the hallway, it's right before we go into class, and she goes, um, how many people know what comes after the word ah? Some of you know what I used to do in my prior life, I won't get into it, but in my interrogations, anything that happened after the word ah, we wrote down as a lie. Right? Ah is the greatest lie detector, right? Teenagers, whenever you ask a teenager a question and they start with ah, anything after that is complete garbage, yes? So when she goes ah, I froze. And went, oh boy, that's not what I was looking for. Because as an evangelical, we never talked about a group of people called the church fathers that Father mentioned. Because if you read and study the church fathers, you have quite a different theology than you do if you don't. And there's a couple of us that in this room that came from an evangelical or a Protestant background who know the difference between the way a Protestant will interpret things versus an evangelical. So, all right, let me just give you two quick antidotes, and then I want to ask you some questions and go into a few things. One, real quickly, there's a story about a guy who's making a rocket. The rocket is going to fire off from Payless Heights, and it's going to go, and it's going to hit the sun. How far is it from here to the sun? Anybody know? 93 million miles. Outstanding. So he does it. He's ready to go. He knocks that rocket off, but right before he sets it off, he does his calculations again real quickly. And he realizes, oh, son of a gun, I'm off. Just, I mean, by a .000001. I'm just, just, I mean, it's so insignificant, fire the thing. 93 million miles later, where's he at? He's not on our son. 
The reason I say that is slow misinterpret or slow false doctrine. We're about 2,000 years old, yes? Anybody want to look where we are today in 2,000 years? We have gay priests. We have all kind of goofy teachings. We have laser shows. We, have, we went this way. We're at a sun, but we didn't hit the sun we wanted. Second one, real quickly. Anybody know church history? Very quickly in 30 seconds. We start out. Jesus, he leaves, right? 12, 12 apostles left. Can you imagine them? They're gone. Can you imagine the questions of the early church? He's gone. There's no Bible to turn to. they got a million questions about everything, right? What, what is baptism? What, is, what does he mean, eat my body? What does he mean about this? What are we supposed to read? How do we do church? When do we, what color is the carpet going to be? How about the choir robes? I mean, lots and lots of questions that they're asking, right, that have to be answered, right? So for the first thousand years, you basically have a, a rule, orthodox rule of believers going, right? Somewhere around the year 1100, now, during those thousand years, things weren't all copacetic and wonderful. There's a million, million things trying to knock the church off its axis, right? With different false teachings, right? Somehow, through the miraculous spirit of the Holy Spirit, power of the Holy Spirit, this thing stays on track for a thousand years. Somewhere around 1100, we have our first branch off, right? What happens? What happens? Come on, 1100. Yeah, well, we got the schism, right? And basically, there's a lot of reasons, but basically, we, there's a discussion about who has the supremacy of the seat of Rome and who should have final authority. So now we have two, right? So around the year 1100, we have two branches of Christianity. That'll last for about another 400 years. Now we're in the year 1500. What happens now? 1500? A guy by the name of Martin Luther, first it's Zwingli, but since he's on the other side of the world, nobody cares about him, so everybody talks about Martin Luther, so we'll talk about Martin Luther. Martin Luther, to his credit, did not want to start a new third branch. He simply wanted to reform the Catholic branch because what was happening there? There was a great Ponzi scheme going on about indulgences. We don't have time to get into it, but basically if you pay enough things to build a cathedral, you'll get your people out of purgatory, life is good, all right? He says, this, we got to stop this, guys. we got to stop this. Eventually, they don't see uh, eye to eye, so he goes, okay, fine. I'll split off on my own. He now forms the third branch called Lutheran faith. By the way, by the time Luther dies, Lutheranism will split twice more into three branches, which still exist to this day. So by the time Luther was even dead, his version split twice. The key, the reason I bring Martin Luther up is when he decided to start the third branch, he created two doctrines that forever changed Christianity. The two doctrines were sola fide, Latin for what? Only faith. Salvation is sola fide. All you have to do is believe. That was huge. That was never Never the pattern in church history for 1,500 years. You were saved for 1,500 years, according to the church fathers, by what? You had to what? Baptism was a huge part of it. Yes, you had to accept Christ. Yes, you had to uh, partake in the Eucharist. But you also had to finish that... What's the Pauline's? Finish the race. Orthodox like to say, saved, being saved, finish it. Hope to be saved, will be saved. Without question for 1,500 years. Now you have someone come along and say, sola fide, all you have to do is believe. You see a can of worms being opened. Because now I don't need anything to do with works, which means I don't have to live a certain way. Which is why Martin Luther fought vigorously to get one book thrown out of the New Testament. He came up with his own Bible. Look at James. The book of James. What's the, what verses in the book of James? That changes everything. Faith without, Faith without works is useless. Dead. Useless. That doesn't go well with sola fide. Enough on sola fide. The other one that he came up with was sola scriptura. Only scripture. The reason I bring these two uh, doctrines up is every single Protestant church of our brothers and sisters in the Protestant faith Believe these two doctrines. There are over 33,000, not my number, the book of uh, religious, uh, Encyclopedia of Religion's number, 33,000 different Christian denominations on earth today. Right? 
the majority, which started off of two or three strands, right, came off of different interpretations of sola fide and sola scriptura. Sola scriptura basically means this. All I need is scripture. If it's not in the Bible, I don't accept it. Sola scriptura also means it is the sole authority for any religious question. As an evangelical, if it ain't in the Bible, I ain't buying it. How many of us has had a, a, a conversation with our evangelical brothers and sisters, and they say, show me in the Bible where it says that. Yeah. That's the sola scriptura. If you can't show me the verse, I don't believe it. A couple of issues with that. Where in the Bible does it say the following 27 books will one day be a canon? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Act, Roman. Does anybody know where that verse is? Does anybody know where the verse of the Holy Trinity is at? I'm not talking about the verse where the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, the Dove. That's not the doctrine of the Holy Trinity. That's just the instance of the three appearance. Where's the doctrine of the Holy Trinity? Every Protestant I know believes in the Trinity. What verse is that in? It's not. Yes? You see where we're having a little, little issue. Wait a minute. So where in the world... Do we get the authority then? Because listen, out of those 33,000 denominations, the sad fact is, is every single one of them is using the same book, correct? They're all using the Bible. So what's the problem? Interpretation. Who has the right to interpret? Who has the right to interpret? So I ask you, who has the right to interpret Scripture? How do you guys interpret it? <laughs> about a ball. Hey, what does this mean? <laughs> Anybody, how do you guys interpret Scripture when you're reading it? <clears throat> the Holy Spirit guides you. Love that. Absolutely what a good Jehovah Witness will say. <laughs> Did you ever have them? Invite them into your house, sit down, make lots of coffee. They're there a couple hours. But they will tell you that the Holy Spirit guides them. And they're serious. And I'm, I'm probably, maybe, yeah, right? It's a true answer, but do you see the danger in that answer? Because every one of them say it. I talk about church and tradition. Yeah. Here's where sola, remember, if you're sola scriptura, what is the only authority you're looking at? You. The Bible, right? And then your interpretation of it, mm -hmm. right? Most people are sincere. Most people are interpreting scripture and want to interpret correctly, correct? But that's how most heresies started as well. Almost every heresy started from somebody within the church. It wasn't from somebody from outside, right? So, literal, symbolic, I came from a background where it was completely literal. If you're a Pentecostal evangelical, you believe in a literal translation, a literal interpretation of the Bible. The earth was created how many days? Six. Six, seven, yep, seven rested, period. No questions asked. I don't want to hear hours? about anything else. How many hours each day? How many hours each day, what day, right? I would ask the question, how many people heard of the rapture thing? Right? Okay, part of the rapture teaching is the, the millennial reign of Christ that will happen. After Christ comes down halfway, takes the people back up, goes back up, then uh, there will be a thousand year peace. When? A millennial reign. Yeah, what is it going to happen? Right. Millennial reign. Thousand years peace. That's what it says in Scripture. I got another question for you. Jesus, or in the Old Testament, it says God Almighty owns the cattle on what? Say it again. Owns the cattle of a thousand hills. Uh oh. Thousand years, millennial reign, literal, so it's a thousand years. If you talk to a rapturist, they are dead set. It's a thousand year millennial reign. They'll argue whether it's pre, mid, or post. That's a whole other argument, right? It's a whole other church. It's a whole other church. Three churches. And then um, he owns a cattle on a thousand hills. Is that literal or symbolic? You get the idea? We're in trouble here. Who gets to interpret that? Right. So in understanding um, the interpretations of, of Sola Scriptura, is the Bible, let me ask you guys right here, is the Bible our sole authority for Matters of doctrine and faith. Why not? Well, I just gave you about 20 reasons. But... Hmm? Which came first? 
The church or the Bible? The church, yeah. You couldn't have a Bible if you didn't have a... The reason that New Testament professor couldn't answer the question for me, because once you admit that the church existed first, and the church created the Bible, well then how can the Bible supersede the authority of the church from whence it's got its authority to begin with, yes? You can't. If you believe in the church fathers, if you believe in ancient theology, you have to accept the fact that sola scriptura is not correct. Once you do that, everything changes. Here's another interesting thing. I find it very fascinating that some people will have no problem, our Protestant brothers and sisters, will have no problem accepting the New Testament canon put together by church fathers, Yet when you ask them, by the way, did you read anything else of the church fathers? Do you accept anything else they teach? No, no, because it's not in the Bible. Wait a minute. You believe that they were guided by the Holy Spirit to pick the right 27 books out of hundreds. Yet you don't want to hear what they have to say about the Eucharist? Nope, because it's not in the Bible. That's, that's a little confusing, yes? Yes? Who would you rather listen to? One time I was doing a Bible study in a church, and I said, you can have a choice of guest speakers. You could have me talk about whatever verse, and I'm 2,000 years removed from it, or I could have St. Paul come in and teach you something. Well, I want to hear from, wouldn't you want to hear from St. Paul? Who the heck cares about what I got to say? I want to hear from St. Paul. Wouldn't you want to hear? Who was the last disciple to live? John. John, he died about when? About 90, Right? Who was his disciple? Who did he pass the torch to? Very important. Very important. Who was his disciple? Polycarp. Right? Okay. Who would you rather hear this stuff on, from me or from Polycarp? I don't know about you, but I would sign up for Polycarp. Do not sign up for me. Sign up for Polycarp. Why? Because Polycarp is about as close as you're going to get to the man. Can't get to Jesus. We can't. But through reading the church fathers, we can get pretty doggone close, yes? If I'm going to listen to somebody tell me what the interpretation is of the Eucharist, whether it's symbolic or literal, I don't want to listen to somebody 500 years later. Yes? Or 2,000 years later. I want somebody that walked and talked with the man and their disciples. Because if the church got it wrong in the first 200 years, then it went off the rails early and, and quick. Or is it more likely that those disciples didn't get it wrong, they kept the apostolic tradition. Did you ever hear that? The apostolic tradition. And that perhaps somebody in the year 1500 decided to make a change with two doctrines that altered everything. You see, if I say the Bible is the only source, then it becomes a matter of interpretation. And now we have a race to the end of interpretation. Because there's so many things to interpret. Can I ask a question? Yeah, please. Why? You might not know the answer to this. I probably don't. Why did they make this decision? Is it just to make things more streamlined and easy? Like, let's just call it out. Hey, if it's not in the book, then it just like avoids there, conflict. Like, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Why? Why? If you didn't hear it, why? Why did all of a sudden we just come up with this in 1500 of sola scriptura? Was it just to make everything streamlined and easy? Uh, the big answer to your question was the reason you say the Bible is the only sole uh, authority is because once you do that, what do you eliminate? I eliminate him, and I eliminate everything before me, all the tradition. Look at the word Protestant. What's the word that's in Protestant? Protest. protest. I protest against it. So there's. it's not by accident that the churches look absolutely completely different than what existed before so uh, as uh, um, understanding of scripture if I only have the Bible I don't need tradition I don't need sacraments what am I throwing out give me the two big ones baptism and Eucharist I don't need those all I need is the Bible in fact you'll hear many Good, and listen, I'm not saying they're going to hell, don't say it, uh, that's not coming up. I got many, many God-fearing Protestants, but you'll hear, uh, uh, that are friends of mine, but you'll hear them say, 
Um, all I need is Jesus and the Bible. And they mean it absolutely sincere. The problem with that is, well, which Jesus? I mean, there's lots of versions of Jesus, and there's lots of versions of Scripture. How do you know what to interpret, right? When you and I come across a passage of Scripture, has anybody ever been confused? <clears throat> right? If you haven't, you haven't read much of it, because there's a lot of stuff that's confusing. Well, how do we know? Who do we go to? Who has the authority? For our Protestant brothers and sisters, they have the final authority. And what does that lead to? Well, it leads to about 33,000 different denominations. If I believe in speaking in tongues, I build a church that has one. If I don't believe in speaking in tongues, I build a, build a different church. If I believe that all you have to do is believe in Christ, I build a church. But then I have a question. Well, what happens if I sin? Well, all your sins are forgiven. Once you accept Christ, all your sins are forgiven. Which sins? All the sins I, create, I committed up to this point? Or all sins like in the future? Well, guess what? There's a division on that. Some churches are no. Up to that point where you accept Christ, and then you're on your own. Other ones are, they just had a huge pastor uh, uh, thing hit the news, and, and he's a Calvinist. So then you have the, the Calvinist ideas come in that you're predestined, right? Because now you've got to cover all these holes. You created a doctrine, and you opened up Pandora's box, and all these questions are coming out, and now you've got to fill it with Band-Aids trying to fix it. And the more Band-Aids you have, the more churches. I'm not saying this, but my personal opinion is, I come from a counterintelligence background, so I always look at things backwards. If I'm the enemy, is this not the most brilliant plan in the world? <laughs> Ask me a question. As far as Bibles, is, is the, the Protestants and some of these other versions after, are their Bibles the same as ours? Right? No. No, in fact, it, it pains me when I see an Orthodox with, with a Protestant Bible, but that's a whole other thing. But. So their Bibles don't contain all the same? Articles. No. Our, the only difference, the New Testament is the same. The difference we'll is the old is the Old Testament. Yeah, Father, I'll touch on that in a little bit. Uh, the big thing for Orthodox, our Old Testament is what? The Septuagint. The Septuagint. Well, it's longer. It has seven extra. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, it has extra. But we use the Septuagint. The Septuagint is what? Somebody, real quickly. The Greek Old Testament. Yeah, the Greek Old Testament. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew and small parts of Aramaic. But when we translated it into Greek, which was the com the big language of the day, so that's the reason that they did that, right? Oh man, I gotta shut up. Um, um, I got the one slide. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, you got a roll. Keep yeah. So you you got the Septuagint. Um, the Septuagint was the same Bible, right? Bible. I'm talking Old Testament that Jesus used. You know when he gets up and he talks from Isaiah and all that. That's the Septuagint. The twelve apostles, you know which they used? Septuagint. Septuagint. That didn't get changed to a good 200 years after Christ is gone, do we have some people, some Jewish sect, change the Old Testament from the Septuagint to another version, which our Protestant brothers and sisters use. Masoretic, Masoretic text. I don't know about you, I don't like that. <clears throat> if I'm going to use an Old Testament one, give me the one that the man used. Because <laughs> if he didn't know any better, well then this is all a sham. <clears throat> but I'll go with that one. I don't like anybody changing things afterwards. It seems to be a little, a little hinky for me. Is there an excellent, oh yeah, okay. Um, does the Orthodox uh, interpret it literally or, or, or symbolic? Huh? Symbolically. Symbolically? Literally? Sometimes yeah. This is an answer that will drive an evangelical nuts. Because you can't say both, right? But it is. Sometimes it is, right? As a Pentecostal, I was taught that it was 100% literal. So then I would ask the question, how many people know what's in John chapter 6 at the end? What's in John chapter 6 at the end? The Eucharist. The Eucharist. About five times the man says, Unless you eat. This is my body, the, the flesh, unless you eat it, no life. But five times he says it. And they all walked away, right? So either he's a terrible teacher, because they knew what he meant. The Jews knew exactly what he meant. That's why they walked away. And then he turns to his disciples and says what? You going to? <laughs> where, where are we going to go? Right? 
So when I was an evangelical, I go, well, wait a minute. How come we don't take that literal? Because how many people know almost all Protestant denominations, communion, they don't even call it Eucharist, communion is symbolic. There's a couple that are, it's both. That's a whole other thing. Um, I said, well, how come, that's not literal. Well, that, no, that, that, he didn't mean it there. So I started going, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You just told me in my Bible class that the, I'm supposed to take this literal, and now you're saying, yeah, but this verse, they didn't mean that. Well, how did you, well, then how do I know what, what you just follow, you follow, and then here it comes, you follow the teachings of your denomination. So I'll leave you with this. I'll shut up. I'll turn it over to the Father. I'll leave you with two very important verses. I don't know if you have scripture or not, uh, a Bible or not, but two verses. Write them down. First one is 1 Timothy 3, 14 and 15. 1 Timothy 3, 14 and 15. He told me where to stand, and I've been all over the place. Um, 1 Timothy 3, 14 and 15. Anybody know what it says? Woo! Woo! Okay, get ready, get ready. Here it comes. You're all over it, Stan. Here it comes. Wait, I can't see. Here we go. Uh, Timothy, who wrote it? Who's talking? Paul. But if I tarry long, you may know how you ought to behave in the house of God, which is the church, the pillar and ground of truth. So if I were to ask you, hey, what's the pillar of truth? You ask nine out of ten Protestants, what's the pillar of truth? What do you think they're going to say? The Bible. Bible. Can't be! Can't be! It didn't exist for 300 years! How could it... So if you're telling me that that is, then how the... What'd they do for 300 years? Just walk around in mass confusion? What's the response by Protestants to that question? Varies. A lot of blank looks. Took me 20 years to think of it. The other verse I want you to, to uh, look at then is, and this is a big one, it should, it's, we all know it, 2 Thessalonians 2.15, right? We all know it. 2 Thessalonians 2.15, what does it say? Okay, listen carefully. For my Bible only, sola scriptura. Therefore, brethren, Thessalonians, who's talking? Who's talking? Therefore, brethren, stand fast, hold to the traditions which you have been taught either by word, word or Deed. epistle. Of course, Litter. because they couldn't write. Is the Bible filled with every single word Jesus ever said? Of course not. Even Scripture says it's not. Are the words that Jesus said that aren't in the New Testament of any less value than the ones recorded? No. How do you know about what else he said or taught? Through the traditions taught either orally or by letter. If you say that oral traditions don't matter, you're in big trouble. You just cut about 90% of church teaching out and opened up a can of Sola Scriptura worms. I'll shut up. Father, go ahead. Okay, we, we have some um, uh, other, um, other questions to ask about interpretation. And remember, first of all, that when we read the Bible in the Orthodox Church, we do so by consensus. This is really what we're looking at. There will always be a consensus of understanding with the scriptures within the life of the church. And let me explain you, to you the, the best way that we can, we can find that is through the church's hymnography. Because basically, when we read the scriptures in the church, we always follow it, or usually do, with hymnography, the hymns that have been written, explaining to us what? How to understand what was just read. So there we have something that is already, it has been in place liturgically for, again, 2,000 years. The church's worship teaches us, it gives us this consensus, uh, which is a way of making sense of the Bible. And then if we look at the interpretation that belongs to this consensus, 
and, and Rick touched on it already, there are four different ways. And, and you should know these because you hear them all the time in those hymns. For example, Rick just mentioned it. Do we read the Bible literally? Sometimes we do. And that's when we hear things like, thou shalt not kill. Do we understand that allegorically, <laughs> uh, typologically, or do we understand it literally? Literally. When you, we read the commandment number five, which is called the hinge commandment in the Old Testament with the Ten Commandments, honor your father and mother, and you will live long uh, upon the earth in the land that God has given to you. Is that something that is um, typological, or is it literal? Literal. So these are good examples, of course. When Christ says, um, uh, fast, when you fast, um, keep it a secret. It's an example of a literal statement that we understood. We, we understand that uh, that piece of teaching. And here's here's a way to say it: at face value. Is, is, are you following me? Just just at face value, as something that is 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 evident immediately. Another lens is historical. So, a good percentage of the Old Testament are historical writings such as 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd uh, and 2nd Kings. Which of the Old Testament characters, so now I, I, will, I will pick on you for a little bit, which of the Old Testament characters occupies the largest piece of biblical territory? One of them takes up a massive portion of the Old Testament. Who is it? Close. Not quite. That's New Testament. You're, 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 you're king. Think again. King David. King David. His writings, or the writings that, that tell us about King David, are all historical. Here's what happened with this faithful man. <clears throat> We also read the scriptures in, in the Old Testament, some in the New Testament, in what we call typological way. Now, this means that one story in the Bible, usually in the Old Testament, is a type that is pointing to someone else. Who can give me an example of a typological uh, story in the Old Testament that's pointing to Jesus? Joseph. Joseph. Tell, me, tell us more about it, Stan. Good. Remember when we just said that in the early church there was no New Testament yet for, for almost 150 years? Where did they see Jesus? Where did they hear about Christ? In these texts from the Old Testament, when they read about Joseph, they're saying, Aha, well this happened to Joseph, but there's something more to this story. Because it's already prophesying about the coming of the Christ, who will be betrayed by his... How many brothers were there? Eleven. There were twelve. How, 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 was he, um, um, how was he disposed of? He was thrown into a pit, which is an image of Christ going down where? Into hell, right? He was redeemed by Pharaoh, and it actually says in the book of Exodus that he was exalted to the right hand. Of Pharaoh. So what does that sound like in our, in our confession um, of faith? It sounds very much like what we say in the Creed and what we hear in St. Paul. That Christ was exalted to the right hand of who? His Father. This is typology. The, the, the other one that is, 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 um, is really good, typology, which we hear about all the time in the hymns of the church, is the Exodus story and the Passover, when Israel is saved from Pharaoh's army and does what? Makes their crossover in what sea? The Red Sea. So you have Pharaoh, you have Moses, you have the people of Israel, you have 
water, think water, and then you have a journey to the promised land. Maybe there's a sacrament in there somewhere. What does that sound like? Baptism. The church loves this story. And it says, yes, this story, miracle, actually happened. But we love it because we are going to show that this is what baptism does for us. We are saved from certain death, right? And we are delivered by being, um, by being um, born through this water and, and made to live in the promised land. As a matter of fact, the fathers of the church, speaking of allegory and, and the book of Exodus. And we will be speaking about the feminine contribution uh, to the church. The fathers of the church read this as a birth, the birth of Israel, because they pass through this water. What happens when a baby is born? They pass through their, their mother's water. In the womb. This is the womb from which a new people is born. Isn't that beautiful? It's really beautiful. And as a matter of fact, Moses himself is a type of the Exodus story because what happens to Moses when he's a baby? He's put out where? Into the into the Nile River, into the water. And Moses means the one who is drawn from the Nile, just like a newborn baby is drawn from his mother's womb. It's exactly the, the, the typology that we use. And this is, of course, where we come with our understanding of baptism, what baptism does, right? Where do we hear this all over the place? In the canons of the church. Every first ode of the Matin service will begin with a summary called an Irmos about Israel being saved from Pharaoh and passing through the Red Sea in, into the desert uh, through the, the miracle that, that Moses accomplished. Why, right? We sing it on Pascha even when Israel passed through the sea without getting wet as if on dry land. We sing that over and over and over again. And this is where the wealth and the richness of our, our, our church and the way that we read the Old Testament and see Christ everywhere. Isn't that powerful? It's really beautiful. Let me give you one other typology. And this is the other third one that is, is in the Old Testament. The early Christians read this third story and said, Christ. Who can tell me what it is? Say it. Close. Okay, maybe there's four stories. <laughs> I'm thinking of something before that, that's still in the book of Genesis, having to do with Abraham and his son. Isaac sacrifice. Oh, here we go. You want to, you want to see some type of typology and parallels? Oh, so he's offered on what? He's offered up Isaac in a valley or on top of a mountain? If you go to Israel and you go to Mount Zion, right? Mount Zion traditionally is the mountain that Abraham offered Isaac up on, where the temple in Jerusalem was built. That was the mount. And um, Isaac is climbing up with his dad and he says here's the wood and he has the fire in his pocket they carried it in a ram's horn you know they had a little fire there probably again how how did they do it before we had matches and and they they had you know flint and so he says well we have the wood and we have the fire but where's the sacrifice what are we going to offer up well, Isaac doesn't quite understand what's happening here yet. And how does Abraham respond to Isaac? What is the literal response in the book of Genesis? God will provide the sacrifice. Right? And then, of course, we know the rest of the story. 
He ties him up, puts him on the rock, lights the fire, draws out his knife, and then Isaac is saved at the very last minute by an angel from heaven. Right? And the Lord blesses Abraham the twelfth time in his life and says, because you have not withheld your only son from me, all the nations of the earth will bless themselves by you. And as a matter of fact, that's where we get the use of the word only. The Lord says to Abraham, take your only son and offer him up on the mountain which I will show you. Right? And he does so without even questioning it. Right? He's put to the test. And when Chrysostom preaches on this, he says this, and this is how we interpret it in the church. That sacrifice is pointing onto another mountain, to Mount Golgotha. Because it's not Abraham's only son, but whose son? The father's only son who was offered up. And then Chrysostom says, what God did not require of Abraham, he did of himself. He gave up his son, his one and only son. And in the book of John, in the first chapter, we, he says that. The only begotten Son of the Father. When we sing that beautiful hymn, Only Begotten Son and Immortal Word of God, that's where it comes from. The only Son. right? Take your only Son and, and offer Him up. So the Christians, they, they saw that as typology. Beautiful stuff, isn't it? Beautiful stuff. And then you, of course, have the three holy use in the... In the in the Babylonian furnace, but we're running a little bit over time, and I want to get to that. Does everybody understand what typology is? It's a story in the Old Testament that is pointing to and fulfilled in the person of who? Jesus Christ. Right? It's Jesus Christ who illuminates the Old Testament. When the priest comes out at, at the liturgy of the pre-sanctified gifts, in between the two Old Testament readings, one from Genesis, one from Proverbs. Everybody bows their head to the ground. And the priest holds up the candle and cries out, sings out this beautiful little liturgical verse. The light of Christ illumines all. What does that mean? Sure, it illumines all of us, all of our hearts, all of our... It illumines the Old Testament that's being read. Now, is that cool or not? Right in between those, those two, two readings. So know this one. And then allegorical. Give me an example of an allegorical story in the New Testament. They're all over the place. And our favorite apostle and evangelist has most of them in his gospel. Who can I pick on? Pat, I told you I'd pick on you. <laughs> Suzanne, I told you I'd pick on you. Give me an example of an allegorical story in the New Testament, in the Gospels. Yes, good, good. I'm going to give you my gold star. <laughs> so, an allegory is a literary dot device where you have an actual story that has no meaning in and of itself, but it has meaning because it is standing for something else. Follow me? <coughs> right? We have lots of idioms that are allegorical. <coughs> Excuse me. That are allegorical idioms. We say one thing and they mean another. Uh, think, think more literally. Okay? Who decides where these, these instances are being used in what scriptures? <coughs> the consensus of the church. Right? Um, and, of course, the way that we read them in the worship. And then this is the question that I like. <laughs> Can there be more than one of these four methods in a story or in a biblical passage? Answer? Yeah. Yes. Who can give me an example? We just talked about it when we said that the story of Exodus is both historical, what number is that? 
number two, and it's number three at the same time. Follow me? So we can double it up. So we will will say this very often. And this is one of the, 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 the good things about what the Orthodox do with the Bible, is that we never limit the scriptures to only one meaning. They are multi-layered. We can hear the same story over and over again, and then the Holy Spirit may touch us. Yes, the Holy Spirit does inspire us, and then we may learn that, oh, there's another meaning to this Bible passage as well. And that's also, that's also really cool. Unfortunately, we don't have the time to, to get into that as, as much as we want. Okay, questions. Uh, Rick, take it over. Oh, I know we're late. Do you, do you want to do these? Okay, or? let's do, um, how do we know that Matthew, Mark, and Luke wrote the Gospels? Who wants to take a quick stab at that? How do we know? Uh, uh, who, who was saying it? Okay, word of mouth consensus, correct? But we said that the church has known from the beginning what the authorship of these books is. By consensus. Right? By consensus. And then we also know, because these authors have left us these, and this is really the cool part, this is where you do your studies and you, all of your reading, and you can also go on a trip to the Holy Land, right, Roger and Chris? And you actually see what those authors are writing about the geography that, that, they, that they lived and, and journeyed through. So, for example, when you go to Jerusalem and you, you see in St. Matthew's Gospel a story about Bethlehem, and then you go to Bethlehem, and you not only see Bethlehem, this beautiful city on, on a beautiful hill, but guess what's next to Bethlehem? This place in Arabic today that's called Bet Sahur, and is about 90 percent Orthodox Christian, and this is called the Shepherd's Hill. This is where the shepherds were. Who tells us about the shepherds? Which one of those evangelists? Matthew. No, I'm sorry, you're right. Luke does. <laughs> right? So, so we, we, we know that because of, of actually kind of this biblical uh, archaeology. Why did it take so long for the, the New Testament to finally be written? Not really until, like Rick said, until the early 90s, mid-90s, were, were all the books written in place? Here's the answer. The apostles never initially sought to write books about Jesus. What was their way of spreading by word of mouth? They were preaching, and that's what the Greek word kerygma means. It means we were preaching about Jesus, and we were doing so by, by word of mouth. Right? It was only when those apostles started to do what? In the, in the early 90s. They were starting to what? They were passing away. <laughs> and their followers, Polycarp, Luke, Mark, <coughs> Mark was Peter's disciple, Luke was Paul's disciple, <laughs> that they said, we better start writing this stuff down on paper. Otherwise what? We're going to lose it. <coughs> and that was kind of uh, what's taking place at the end of the first century. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, oh, let's just touch on a little bit of, of the contradictions. Is this where I'm going to ask some questions? How many of you have heard this this criticism? I don't believe in the Bible because there are too many contradictions. What do you do with that? How do you answer this criticism? Talk to me. <coughs> You're going to get into trouble. Yeah, you open exactly. How you yeah, exactly. What's My a good? My husband and I can tell you the same story. It'll be completely they, they different. Did. Yeah. Oh, we're, <laughs> My perspective. That's is what we're looking at. Than my husband's the question revolves around this, which is related to the contradictions in the in the New Testament. 
specifically about the resurrection of Christ. Why don't we have just one story of Jesus in the Bible? Wouldn't it have been a, a good thing to consolidate Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John into a single gospel? That would have made it a lot easier because there are just different stories about what happened at the resurrection. They don't all line up. They don't really contradict each other, but they don't all line up. They're different perspectives. And the early church fathers said, no, we are not going to combine all of these stories into one, because each of these different perspectives is valuable. And they don't contradict. They're just different uh, uh, vantages of this. Yes. Yes. Uh, what are different perspectives because there were different audiences that may hear us? Exactly. Matthew's audience were the Jews living in Palestine, the early Jewish Christians. Matthew's gospel is a Christian Torah. There are five sections of Matthew's gospel that are directly and can be directly aligned with the book, uh, with, with, the, with the Old Testament with the Torah, the first five books of the, this was written for Jews. Mark's gospel is written for pagans, but we, we know where, God, where, where, where Mark was living at that time. Who knows? Rick, you can't say. Who knows? Where was Mark's gospel composed? We know exactly where it was written and when it was written. It was written probably about 62 AD, probably the earliest of the gospels. Who knows where it was written? In Mark's Gospel, at the, at the crucifixion, you have this very fascinating book, verse. And Jesus is carrying his cross, and they compel the passerby, in Mark's Gospel only, Simon of Cyrene, to carry the cross of Jesus. Remember that part of the Bible, of the, of the crucifixion story? But in Mark's Gospel, he adds another verse. And they compelled Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, <laughs> to carry Jesus' cross. The first time I read that, it was like, huh? Who are Alexander and Rufus? They're not the disciples of Jesus. They're not the apostles. Nowhere else in the New Testament are these two names mentioned. This is the memorial for St. Mark's Gospel because you have these two brothers living in a suburb of Alexandria, Egypt, whose father did what? Dan? Carried Jesus' cross. The two sons of Simon of Cyrene were in the church where the Gospel of Mark was being written. Cool? You see what I'm saying? We know where Matthew was. We know where Luke was. Luke was written for Greeks all over the place. And, 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 um, and uh, uh, St. John's Gospel was also written mostly for, uh, for uh, a Greek, um, Greek Christian, but, but not living in Greece, but living in what is today modern-day Turkey. And, and his is a very uh, much more philosophical um, example. So let me just... Um, we're almost done tonight, and I want to have some more questions from you. But um, let me give you an example of some of the differences in, in the resurrection. In, um, in Mark's Gospel, it says that there was only one angel that was at the tomb of Jesus. In the other three Gospels, how many angels are in the tomb? Two. So which is it? Hmm? It doesn't matter. There was an angel, or there were two angels, and the church says, we really don't know, but we're going to lean towards two. John Chrysostom says, well, when the, one angel, when the one angel speaks in Mark's gospel, Mark just doesn't take the time to say what? There was a second one there as well. Right? Um, who, reached the, who reached the tomb first? The women apostles. Who went into the tomb first? (laughs) 
in some of the Gospels, the women go in and they see the angels and the empty tomb. And in whose Gospel is Peter going in first? St. John's Gospel. So was it the women or was it Peter that goes in first? The church says, really doesn't matter. We don't know. Just that the, the tomb is empty and both Peter and the women evidently saw this, this tomb. So it go, kind of goes like this. And I was talking with Rick about it before. Do you remember watching the Michigan-Michigan State game like in 2015? Do you remember that game? I remember several games. <laughs> <laughs> what happened, of course, if I'm a Michigan State fan, I'm going to remember that game. Why? Because who won? <laughs> Michigan State won. Go green, right? <laughs> so this is a famous game because what happens at the end is that the quarterback is pinned way back down on the 20-yard line, and he has to hail Mary that football all the way down to the other side of the field. And guess what? The receiver from Michigan State caught it and landed just so that the ball was touching what line? The goal line. Right? And the refs come up and they look at it and then they put it back on the TV and they look it over again and everybody's waiting like for eight minutes. Did they win? Did they lose? Did they win? Did they lose? And they decided what? That they won. Now, on one side of the stadium are all Michigan State students. And this is a huge rivalry game in, in Michigan. There are stores in Michigan that are called the Great Divide, where you can buy on one side of the store green and white, and on the other side, yellow and blue and maize. Mm -hmm. right. On the other side of the stadium are Michigan students. And they see the same exact play. How do they, what do they say about that play? Was it a touchdown or not? No. Right? How many advantages? Two, maybe three or four. How many plays? One play. So the resurrection can be understood, you know, in, in this kind of way. Um, but the church allows for this variation uh, in the scriptures, and it's very, very important. It's very, very important. Um, there was a guy in the second or third century named Tatian who said, I don't like those four Gospels. I'm going to cut them all out and write one. And guess what the church did? Excommunicated him promptly. Because he said, you can't change what the apostles have given to us. Right? It's fascinating stuff, really. Fascinating. His name was Tatian. All right. <clears throat> okay. So we'll stop here. I had some other questions that I wanted to answer or ask about science and the Bible. Are there any other, other questions that you, you might have for this class? Mm -hmm. We're hoping that, of course, that we don't monopolize, you know, all of the talking. We want to hear from you as well. Good question. What happened to the other Gospels? Good. So what was, read the question. Go ahead, Chris. What happened to the other so-called Gospels? Okay. So these are called the Gnostic Gospels. The Gospel of St. Mary Magdalene, the Gospel of St. Thomas. There was a whole bunch of them. There were a whole bunch of apocalypses. These Gospels were written much later than the other four Gospels. Remember I said that the four Gospels are all done by the early 90s, 91, 92, the latest 94, St. John's Gospel. These are all coming in the second century. And they're being written by these Gnostic heretic Christians, so-called, who are attaching a pseudonym. They're, they're borrowing a name from one of the apostles in order to credit their writing. So they're basically lying to you and saying, I didn't write this book. This comes to us secretly uh, from the original hand of the Holy Apostle Thomas. But nowhere in that book is Christ born as a genuine human being in the flesh, and nowhere in those Gospels, any of them, does Jesus actually die 
as a human being on the cross. Matter of fact, in most of them, Jesus just fakes his own death and then wakes up a couple of days later. Right? He's not resurrected. He's what? What's the other word that starts with the R that sounds similar? Resuscitated. So that's the answer. That's why those books were rejected. Because of content. It's not the same Jesus that is given to us from those apostles. Good question. Good question. What else? One more question and then we'll close. Mary Jane. <laughs> Good question. We'll come to that more, I think, um, maybe next week when we speak about the holy tradition of the church. Um, that was also mentioned in the reading that I gave to you by Dr. Jeannie Constantine. So, is it because the women have nothing to say? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can laugh. <laughs> but, but it's not because of that at all. It's it's more. This is a more cultural, more cultural aspect of the church's life. Um, who were the ones that were taught how to read and write two thousand years ago? Men. Who were taking care of their homes and their families? The the women. Was there anything less than? For a woman to be doing so. I mean in terms of value. Did it mean that their work and their place was less than the apostles? Absolutely not. And where do we see that confirmed for us? With the women apostles. In the New Testament, in the Gospels, who are the first to see Jesus and his resurrected from the dead. To experience the empty tomb. Why were they the first? And I promise I'll shut up with this. But once I get on a roll, it's hard for me to stop. Why were they the first to see the empty tomb? They were up and working. <laughs> Mary Jo. I would love to hear what the Timber Bears have to say. Mm -hmm. So we don't know what they have to say, except that they were of one voice, and I will say this too, that they were of one voice with the, the, the holy apostles and, and the whole life of the church. The question might be, were they saying anything different than what we find um, being taught in, in the epistles? Actually, the church would say their witness is through their service, and that's probably even a greater witness than someone writing down a gospel. So it's about value. It's about value. We'll talk more about this next week with Holy Tradition and also when we talk about um, uh, the role of women within, within the life of the church. So, you know, we have to be careful uh, when, we, when we work in some of these more modern critical theories. Um, we have to be sure that we understand how the church sees this first and then we answer all of those questions. Okay? Very good. Thank you so much. Next week, uh, 6.30, and I will be sending up. Yes? Okay, let's pray.